How important are small things? Well, how about if you have one flat tire? Hmm, that might be pretty important. How about if you have a car that works great, but no gas in the tank? Not a good thing. How about if you have a car that everything else works well, but the battery's dead? You know, what might seem like a small thing ends up being really important. Everything is important. Here's a word, every one is important. Here's what God wants to say to you today. You are important. Somebody said, if you were the only person, Jesus would still have come to earth and given his life on the cross for you or for me. That's absolutely true. There is no one that God thinks is small or unimportant or unworthy. The fact is God loves you so much and he wants to give you his grace today. In the midst of a world that sometimes says, ah, oh, you're small, you don't matter, you're insignificant, God has a very different word. Join with us today, and we're going to talk about how God can take small beginnings and make great endings. God bless you. Wow, thank you, kids. I just want you to know you are probably more coordinated and pay better attention than a lot of us who are older adults. And thank you for what you are doing. That was beautiful. And thank you to our uh, handbell ringers over on the side as well. You'll have an opportunity to hear them later. It is now my privilege to present to you an invitation to worship. We're not just here as an invitation to hear something nice or watch something cute, but an invitation to worship. And so those who have already helped us have ushered us into a time of worship. During this time, uh, God is going to move among us. We have the privilege in the midst of this wonderful Christmas celebration of having a baptism today. And what a blessing that is for our whole church family. Uh, we have a video, I think, an invitation for this evening, and I'm not sure when you guys are ready to show that. Uh, Doug, wave at me whenever the time is right. Uh, he is saying this, which we're looking for an interpretation, but whenever we see that up there, uh, we'll go ahead. But I want to give you, uh, a, say, a couple of things here by way of welcome. First of all, uh, there may be some of you who are guests here for the first time. We want you to know you are welcome as a part of our family. Others of you may be guests of your children. You came to see your grandchildren uh, in the uh, presentation we had earlier. We're glad that you're here, and we want to extend a welcome to all of you to come back and to be a part of our church family. We want this Christmas season to be one that is rich and filled with God's grace for you. This afternoon at 5 o'clock, ah, there it is. So uh, are we going to see this now? And he's shaking his head no. But at 5 o'clock, we will have Christmas in black and white. You see all the decorations that are up here. And so that's going to be at 5 o'clock this afternoon. Come back and be here. And then uh, right after we're done, if you would, Betty and I want to extend an invitation to you to come by the senior pastor's parsonage and uh, stop by our open house. We would love to have you stop in for a few minutes, have something to eat, 
and you will help to make our Christmas special. You are all invited. Uh, you see in front of you this majestic conglomeration of gifts. These are given through our caring Christmas tree in order to help some who might not otherwise have anything for Christmas. I'm so grateful for the generosity of our church. I've got to tell you, I was talking with Jack Rudolph, and, and I m mentioned over here, we have never before had a wheelchair given. But one of, this goes also for children and for older adults, and we've never had anybody ask for a wheelchair before. But what a wonderful, practical way of touching the life of someone who is in need of that. This happens because of all that you have done. One last thing, next Sunday, you will want to be back here in force. It is one of the great Sundays of our year. Our choir will be pre uh, presenting its Christmas uh, musical, both at the early service and at the 11 o'clock service. So make it to either one of those. But that's a time when we see God touch us in a wonderful way. Music speaks to our heart at a whole different kind of level. And so uh, you'll have this wonderful opportunity to worship our Savior. Now let's turn our, light, our attention to the lighting of our second Advent candle. You'll find in your bulletin uh, a, uh, an insert which will help you along. On this Advent journey, we are mindful of the brokenness of the world which surrounds us. We long for peace that surpasses all understanding. As we look around us, we see hostility that exists between neighbor and nation. We long for the peace that surpasses all understanding. As we look beside us, we see fractured relationships and unforgiving hearts. We long for the peace that surpasses all understanding. As we look within ourselves, we confess the reconciling words we have yet to speak and restoring deeds we have yet to do. We long for the peace that surpasses all understanding. This morning, we light two candles. The first candle reminds us of a starry night in a quiet stable when God changed the course of human history. Our hope is firm, for in our Savior's birth, the Word, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The second candle symbolizes God's perfect peace in an imperfect world. The season of Advent calls us to turn our eyes to the Prince of Peace who has come and will come again.
gracious God, we pray that you will help us to see glimpses of your peace in our fractured world. You alone are the Prince of Peace. Help us to remember this Advent that we can also be agents of peace to those around us and in our world. Help us to seek your perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.
be seated. And as we go to the Lord in prayer, let's take a moment to personally connect with God. And then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer. We'll join together in the Lord's prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Advent God, purple and blue, you have already prepared a place for us. So help us to prepare a place for you in our hearts. We want to be ready for you, but we're set in our bent and bumpy ways. Create in us the capacity for repentance and the vulnerable grace of openness. Forgive us for putting all our time and energy into making all sorts of material preparations for Christmas. Buying gifts, gathering food, baking cookies, writing cards, all important. But preparations which give temporary pleasure compared to the lasting peace Christ gives. Help us meet you as you come to us. Help us prepare your way in our lives and to announce your coming in love to others. Take, O oh God, what we give and transform it to your glory. And take what we do and transform it to your acting. And take what we say and transform it to your singing. Take, O oh God, what we live and transform it to your creating. Hear our prayer for those rough places in our lives and in the lives of others we silently now name before you. Fill the valleys with your light. Level the unseen paths with your grace. Grant that your spirit might so move us and others that your saving presence be visible to all. We pray for your church around the world that it may repent, turning from all that is second rate towards the abundance in Christ Jesus. We pray for those who have no bread, no coat, no home, no hope for tomorrow. Inspire us to embrace that better future where poverty and distress is never left without a generous response. Bless these gifts on this altar as we share with others. Make them be peace and hope and love. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus who taught us his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Every voice in the 
concert ring evermore and evermore. Christ to thee with God the Father and Holy Ghost to Hymns and chants and high thanksgiving And unwearied praises be Honor, glory, and dominion An eternal victory Evermore and evermore. Evermore and evermore. Thank you, Jerry. We invite the children to come forward and join Laura Stanilin up front here. Uh, Laura, I think your place has gotten <laughs> messed. Let me put this up. You still have your sack somewhere where you can see it? Okay, good. Children can pass out the rest of them while you're while you're going ahead. I wanted to bring you some M and M's to help celebrate the second week of Advent. Everyone, take one bag, but don't open it until your parents tell you it's okay. Hold your bag in your hand and look at the letter M on the M and M. Now turn it over, and the M becomes a W. Turn it again and it's an E. Turn it one more time, and it's a three. Do you know what the M&Ms have to do with the Christmas story? They tell the Christmas story, and it's one I'm sure you know. It took place in a stable long ago, a long time ago. The E is for East, where the star shone so bright. The M is for the manger, where baby Jesus slept that night. The three is for the wise men bearing gifts when they came. W is for worship when we praise his name. So as you eat these candies later, not now, or share with your friends, remember the meaning of Christmas. It's a love story that never ends. Let us pray. God, thank you for the Christmas story and for sending your son Jesus to love us all. Help each one of us to love everyone like you love all of us. Show us little ways that we can tell love all around us. Let's, let's tell this week that Jesus loves us with all his heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'll never look at M&Ms exactly that same way again. I'd never heard that, Laura. Thank you. Uh, let's stand and greet one another in Christian love.
Welcome. Welcome and greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We sing together the Carol 234, one of my favorites, O Come All You Faithful. We're going to sing just the first and the sixth stanza, just one and six. Join me in singing. They're on the insert, and you'll also see them on the screen. Stanzas one and six. Join me in singing. We invite the ushers to come forward as they do. We are so grateful for the people of God who give generously that the work of God might be done in His world. So today, as you give, I want to say thank you in behalf of all the people and groups who are ministered to by your generosity. Would you join with me in prayer? And oh, just a reminder, would you sign the attendance registers later on? Uh, and let us know of your presence with us, and if there's any way that we can be of help to you, it would be our honor to serve. Let's pray. Father, how good you are to us. We thank you so much that in your generosity, you gave your very best. Would you help us on this Christmas day, or Christmas, uh, in this Christmas season, to give to you the best that we have, that the light of Christ might shine. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Well, this has been a wonderful time of worship. The sermon is entitled, Small Town Beginnings. And how about a small sermon to go with it here? Uh, we've had a wonderful time of worship, and thank you, and <laughs> a former member of our church over here. Let me share with you a few things that, uh, uh, just a couple of stories on my heart to make one simple point that I think God wants us to hear today. Does anybody know what was going on? This is not a trick question, but just going on in the world on July the 18th, 1918. World War I. There's a world war going on, and uh, the whole world was just caught up in this thing. Nobody really knew what was, how it was all going to end and what was going to come out of it. In a small village named Mveso, Transke, South Africa, a child was born there by the name of Roli Lahla. And you just have mercy on me if I've murdered the pronunciations on these things. The child, that, that name means one who pulls on a tree branch. And the, the real meaning behind it is somebody who's always a troublemaker and getting into things. Well, he was born into a, a home where they had, uh, his father had a position and had some money. But then they came into some kind of a, a trouble. His father lost both his position and his money. They were just at subsistence living for many years. And then, at the, if things weren't bad enough, when Roli Lala was nine years old, his father died. He didn't really know what to do, but somebody else took him in. They sent him off to... Uh, a school while he was over there, he became deeply convinced that all people are equal and ought to be treated that way. So he began to uh, pr press this issue around him wherever he was. The school kind of booted him out for a while, and the family didn't know what to do with him, so they arranged a marriage for him. They thought, this would settle him down, and they just picked somebody for him to marry. Well, he didn't know what to do. He knew that wasn't the life for him, so he ran away. You've heard of the runaway bride? Well, this was the runaway bridegroom. And he ran away to Johannesburg and began to invest his life where he felt he was called. Well, fast forward, and he spends 27 years in jail. But in 1993, this Roli Lahla Mandela, who was given the name Nelson, he received the Nobel Peace Prize, and the next year he became president of that country. He had led that country through his faithfulness out of the place where they had kept people down and said, no, that's not God's way, that's not the right way, but all people are created equal because Nelson Mandela was willing to step forward, his nation was changed, and I think it's not too big a thing to say, our world has been changed. All started in a, a little town named Mveso. I bet you if you go to South Africa right now, they probably can't find that little town either. It's just a little place. Who would ever think somebody who would make a difference would come from a little place like that? Anybody here ever been to Hodgenville, Kentucky? We had somebody else in the early service who had gotten lost and went there too. <laughs> the 16th president of the United States was born there and in a little log cabin, and they gave him the rather ostentatious name of Abraham. And Abe Lincoln was born in this little frontier town, this little log cabin. Who would ever have thought that out of this little place there would come a great leader. Well, I've got a story that'll top both of those. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to just read a portion of this. Uh, let's go down through verse 6, and we'll get to the rest of that story another time. But in Matthew chapter 2, listen to this incredible small town story. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, 
Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen his star as it arose, and we have come to worship him. Herod was deeply disturbed by their question, as was all of Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law. Where did the prophet say the Messiah would be born, he asked them. In Bethlehem, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. This is from the book of Micah. O Bethlehem of Judah, you are not just a lowly village in Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Who could ever have imagined that from a little village named Bethlehem would come somebody who would change the whole world? Well, clearly this was not on Herod's radar. Herod was really ticked off about this, and who knows why. Herod was a mean-spirited dude. He had his own sons put to death because he was afraid they would try to take over from him. A nasty character. But you've got to wonder if he was thinking, a king from Bethlehem? So what's wrong with Jerusalem? We tend to think, well, if a place is small, if somebody's insignificant, surely nothing of great import is going to happen there. Matter of fact, later on, this baby, Jesus, born in Bethlehem, ends up going to Nazareth. There's a really interesting short story in the Gospels about Nazareth. One of the disciples in the making goes and finds another person who's going to become a disciple, as it turns out, and says, hey, we found the Messiah. He said, well, where's he from? Nazareth. And he says, Nazareth? Does anybody remember what the next line is? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, we're talking small town stuff here. Surely nothing of any import is going to come out of Nazareth. But God seems to delight in choosing people who often are forgotten by the world, but He has chosen them for His own purpose. Do you remember that really wonderful story in the Old Testament about King David when he's being chosen to be king? All that God tells Samuel is, you're meant to go and anoint one of Jesse's sons to be king. So he goes there not knowing who that is. And so Jesse lines up now, how bad is this? Not even all of his sons. He lines them all up except one. And they, when uh, Samuel looks there, he sees the oldest one, who is the you know, probable choice and nice-looking, strong, mature character. And he thinks, oh, I bet that's it. God said, no, that's not the one. And he goes on down. God says, I haven't chosen any of them. So Samuel looks at Jesse and says, have you run out of kids? And Jesse says, well, I got one more, but, I mean, he's just a little shepherd boy out taking care of the sheep. And he says, well, why don't you go call him? And he was the one God had chosen. It seems that God delights in choosing the people that the world so often forgets. Small things matter to God. Why did God end up going to a small town in Nazareth? Because he found a young woman with a big commitment who said... I'm willing to be used by you, God, in any way that you need. God is still looking for people, small or otherwise, with big commitment. Are you willing to be used? God can and will use you. I want to tell you a simple story. I've, I've told it before, but it's, it has so much meaning to me, and particularly for two reasons. One, I know of a dear friend in our church who has one of her best friends, and there was a suicide in the family. They're not from our congregation, but they're a part of our family. And the second reason is this. Just a reminder to us all that this season, which is filled with so much joy and beauty for most of us, is for many people a very difficult time. And so here's, here's the simple story. Uh, a boy was going home from school, and he had his arms just packed with stuff. And have you ever tried that, and all of a sudden one thing falls, and you try and pick it up, and you drop two, and try and pick those up, and you drop four, and it, everything just collapsed? Well, there was a, another boy walking along beside him, back from school, like freshman kids, 
And this other boy saw the fellow drop all the stuff, and he said, well, here, let me help you. And started picking it up and soon realized that if he piled all the things back in the first boy's arms, they'd just drop them all again. He said, well, let me carry some of this. You just got too much stuff. And said, where's your home? And he told him, and it, he said, well, it's not far from where I live, and I'll just walk home with you. So he carried the stuff home, uh, got to the house, and the first boy who owned all the stuff said, you want to come in for a minute? And the other boy said, sure. So fast forward quickly through the story, the two of them become best friends. Fast forward a little more, it's graduation from high school, and the boy who held all the stuff, smart as a whip, and he was the class valedictorian, so he got up to get the va give the valedictory speech. It was unlike any that anybody had ever heard there, and it was one that nobody who was there ever forgot. Here's what he said. He got up and said, you all know that my best friend is, and he named the other boy. He said, I'm going to tell you something today that even he doesn't know. He said, one day I was walking home some years ago with some stuff in my arms, and I dropped it, and he picked the stuff up and helped me. And He doesn't know it, but he saved my life that day. I was clearing out all the stuff out of my locker because I was so depressed and discouraged, I was going home to take my own life that day. But he stopped, and he cared, and I thought, well, maybe there's still some reason to live. And I want to bear witness and thanks to my friend who cared enough about me in a simple way that he saved my life. I need to tell you, friends, you and I may not always recognize who those people are, but they're around us. Maybe somebody who might literally take their own life physically, but I'm telling you, there are lots of people who are just about this close to giving up. They are so discouraged. They want to know, is there hope for me? God is sending you and me out to love them and care for them. So I want to give you just three simple things and invite you during this time up to Christmas to take seriously, to do one or more of these things. Number one, you may say, oh, that's just that's a small thing. And it, it is, but you never know. Would you say Merry Christmas to people? Uh, you know, they may say Happy Holiday or whatever, but tell them Merry Christmas. I'm not leading a boycott. I'm not trying to start a protest. I'm just trying to say, in our world, let's just go ahead. This is our faith. This is our Savior. And I want to wish people a Merry Christmas. I've got a good atheist friend. And I tell him Merry Christmas. All year long, I tell him, God bless you. And I'm not trying to get under his skin. I just want God to bless him. He may not believe in God, but God believes in him. So, would you look at people and just say, Merry Christmas? I have found 99.9% .9 of the time I get a smile back and a Merry Christmas back. Sometimes somebody who just looks like, you know, somebody ran over their best hunting dog, just mo and you wish them a Merry Christmas, and you can see something new happening in their face. A small thing, but God uses small things. Here's the second thing. Would you give a gift to somebody? I mean, look at this. How awesome is this? But maybe it's just a small thing, but would you give a gift to somebody that God puts on your heart? And the third thing is this. Would you pray with somebody? I mean, I know we, somebody will say something. We'll say, oh, I'll pray for you. Would you pray with them? I mean, I know we do pray for them, but... It's a gift to pray with somebody. I met Angie yesterday. I had never seen her before. I went up to visit a friend from our church who's in the hospital. And as I was going down the elevator, uh, a young lady was on there. And I just said, how's your loved one doing? She said, oh, not good. She looked to me to be 30-ish. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, yeah, it's my brother. He's dying of cancer. Seeing how young she was, I, I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. How old is he? He said, well, he's, he's 37 years old. And in the elevator had arrived by that time, we'd gotten off. And, and I just said, well, could we just pray together? And she said, 
Well, sure. And we just stopped there in the hallway in the hospital, and I held her hands and we prayed. And don't even start with, oh, you're the preacher, and you can do stuff like that. <laughs> Listen, I was dressed in shorts and a T-shirt. She didn't know, you know who I was. You can do this. You know, and in that just quiet moment, Jesus was there. See, this isn't about us just being nice to people. This is about Jesus living in us and Jesus reaching out to others through us. We can do that. All around us are people who need God's grace. Somebody said this, why did God put us here if not to make someone's journey easier? Let's extend God's grace to those who are around us. You may not change the world, but you might change someone's world through Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are really liable to get so busy and dashing through things that sometimes our focus is all on ourselves and what we have to get done. Would you slow us down and help us to start thinking about others? And it may just be in as small a way as saying Merry Christmas or a small gift, an act of kindness, or through saying a prayer with somebody that Jesus might change their world. We want to make ourselves available to you. When you came to Mary those many years ago, you sort of asked, you know, are you willing to be the mother of my son? And she said, yes. You're still looking for people when you come and say, I want to use you. Are you willing? Would you find here hundreds of us who say, yes, Lord, use me in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand together, and we're just going to sing one verse, and, and then we're going to uh, be through. We're going to stand and sing, um, What Child Is This? And would you join with me in worship? light of joy in your heart be as hard to put out as that candle. <laughs> We're so grateful for our acolytes. You know, they take this light out with them. It's a symbol of the light of Christ going to the world. Would you join hands with those who are around you? I uh, want to just say a, a couple of, of quick things. Number one, our dear friend and brother in Christ, Bill Stokes, died yesterday. His funeral will be tomorrow at Carson McLean at 2 o'clock. Uh, secondly, remind you to be back here at five o'clock uh, for our presentation of Christmas in black and white, our children youth choirs. It is going to be a delight. Uh, third thing, those of you, uh, I think our, our um, uh, workman's comp is paid up, but all of you who are strong and burly of character, we need to uh, clear some of this stuff off, and if you could come and help us, we'd be grateful. Some others are helping to move these uh, Christmas items. Would you let those who know about that do that uh, so that we don't get them confused? They're all kind of packed together. And then after the Christmas with black and, in black and white uh, is done, Betty and I would like to invite you on this bitterly cold <laughs> Valdosta evening to uh, come to our house. Uh, we discovered yesterday our air conditioner is broken which we need, but it is, I think it's going to be repaired by this afternoon, so uh, we'll turn the temperature down, but we'd love to have you come and, and be with us at our house if you can sometime between 6.30 and 8.30 this evening. You know what I see when I look out here? I see hundreds of people that God is sending into Valdosta, 
hundreds of people who are going with God's grace just to speak a small word, to do a small act of kindness, to minister God's grace through prayer in ways that might just change someone's world. So, brothers and sisters, go in God's grace, and may the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forever. Well, small beginnings can have incredible endings. Remember, what was it that Jesus... Let's, let's, yeah, got that one. All right, this is a redo <clears throat> uh, for the outtake in three, two... Well, small things really are important. Remember, what was it that God found in Nazareth or in Bethlehem? Well, what he found was someone who was willing to be used. Someone, maybe they seemed small in the world, world's eyes, but they had great commitment. Today, won't you open your heart to Jesus? Today, He can use you to change, if not the world, change somebody's world around you. God bless you.